his experience and knowledge with us in, a, in the topic of the draining ear. So we're going to record this lecture for people who can't join us today. We'll put it on the YouTube channel. Misha will do that. Um, in the meantime, uh, Mood, I'm, it's a pleasure to, uh, I kind of feel like I know you already. Okay. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure of mine to uh, give you the form and uh, share knowledge with us and um, we will uh, proceed accordingly. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, so, Richard's already given you some background. I'm I'm an ENT surgeon with an academic interest in Brighton, um, but uh, I, I've, my academic interest really, um, as well as my clinical interest, is in the chronically discharging ear and and also in resource development. So. I've been involved in training people from community health workers uh, right through to ENT surgeons in a number of different countries as indeed um, uh, Richard and his colleagues have as well. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is some aspects of the chronically discharging ear. It's a small group so feel free to, uh, to, to um, ask questions as we go or to ask questions at the end of course. And I do apologize if, if some of this uh, may seem uh, too simple for you or something you already know, but for me, I always, um, uh, I always ask people to assume I don't know very much, and so uh, um, uh, we'll, we'll make a start. So, so what we're talking about here is the discharging ear, and this is sometimes how things present to us. and. Um, the management of this. Um, like I say, uh, there's a, a, a plethora of, of how far you want to take this. I'm going to give you some pointers as to what I think uh, are useful um, clinical um, decisions uh, to be made about the discharging ear. But for those of you who are more interested, um, we've just recently completed a review of, of various treatments uh, through Cochrane, um, which some of you will be aware of. Cochrane is a, is a mechanism to gather all the existing research. So we've just um, about to complete seven reviews of how to treat discharge um, of the chronically discharging in chronic subdevotitis media. And for those of you who are interested, you may wish to read those. They're all freely available online. So again, I'll start quite simple because it may be that certainly uh, others who will listen to this later will not be as experienced as some of our audience here. Obviously, the discharging ear includes uh, uh, different sorts of areas that the, the discharge could come from. It could, of course, come from the um, outer ear, but it could come from the middle ear. Um, the outer ear and the middle ear, of course, we uh, ENT surgeons will be well aware of. Um, the outer ear including the pinna and the ear canal, so it's an inflammation and infection of the ear canal. And, uh, or an inflammation and infection of the mid ear space. Now, discharge is really only going to happen if you've got a hole in the tympanic membrane. Um, so that's what we find is either an infection of the outer ear or an infection of the tympanic membrane with a hole. Of course, the mid ear space includes um, the tympanic membrane and the three ossicles. And when we look in otoscopy, this is a normal eardrum. Again, for our audience, they're probably well rehearsed, but for those who may be less um, experienced, it's, um, here is the, an image of the ear canal, the normal healthy eardrum or tympanic membrane, the first bone of hearing, the malleus, um, and you can see some normal blood vessels on there, and the second bone of hearing, the incus is sometimes visible in some of these views. So when we think about the ear and we think about what normally um, may prevent infection. So in the ear itself, uh, the ear canal um, normally has some bacteria living inside it, normal bacteria that may live on skin. One of the ideas is that wax, and this is uncertain, that the wax that's produced, this normal uh, material that's produced in the ear canal actually helps to keep uh, the ear cleansed of bacteria as well as skin. So it has properties within it that are antibacterial. And certainly there's been some studies where if you put wax on top of bacteria, it appears to kill them. So wax is actually part of a healthy normal ear and um, is one of the mechanisms to keep um, the ear free of problems. But sometimes it fails or sometimes there may be other reasons that lead to infection. 
in terms of the middle ear, actually that's of course a fairly complex space and not just um, uh, what we see be beneath the eardrum. It's this what we call a middle ear cleft. So it's an air filled space, including the eustachian tube, which links to the back of our nose in the nasopharynx. It includes the tympanic cavity. So that's the ear space be uh, behind the eardrum and the mastoid air cells is uh, the system of uh, honeycomb structures uh, behind um, the uh, middle ear cavity. And we also understand that this has a uh, multiple function. So if we look at this in a diagram, the lower part of this middle ear space actually has an immune function. If you look at the lining of that ear, the epithelium, it is covered with this uh, mucociliary epithelium, it's covered with these cells that uh, secrete mucus. And that mucus is then produced and passed down the eustachian tube to clear out the uh, middle ear space. Um, in fact, I won't go into it today, but actually the other part of the ear um, around the mastoid is involved in gas exchange. So this lower part of the ear is involved in immune function, cleaning out the ear, and has quite a large task because if we look at the back of the nose within what we call the nasopharynx, that space behind uh, uh, the, the nasal cavity proper, you find there are lots of bacteria. So within the nasal cavity, we have around uh, an average of two to six million bacteria living in our, na in our nasopharynx, the space at the back of the nose, um, uh, in any healthy, normal individual. Sometimes these bacteria seem able to get up that eustachian tube and the immune function of the eustachian tube, that sort of clearance out of, of, of debris um, seems to cause uh, problems or seems to fail and then you get an infection. And that infection may be a, a normal childhood ear infection an acute otitis media, or it may be a more persistent infection, which I'll come on to talk about. I don't need to go into it here, but there's a lot of theory about there's something wrong with the tube and the diameter of the tube that causes all of these problems with middle ear disease. But um, uh, the evidence for that is actually rather weak and it's probably a much more complex phenomenon uh, evolving um, how the immune system reacts to the presence of bacteria and a failure of that system. So for the discharging ear, we may see a number of symptoms. We may see pain as well as the discharge that you can see inside the tympanic membrane, and the patient may also complain of hearing loss. Unfortunately, none of these symptoms is going to necessarily get the diagnosis because pain can be present in different sorts of disorders. It may be present in an outer ear infection, an otitis externa. It may be present also with an acute ear infection, an acute otitis media. It may be present to some extent in chronic ear infections. And the discharge may be such that you can't actually see what's going on. So this uh, space in the, uh, this image in the middle shows a chronically discharged, uh, and discharging ear rather, um, and I can't tell you what's wrong with that. It could be an otitis externa. It could be that there's a hole in the eardrum deep down. So toscopy, examining the ear and cleaning out the ear is critical to getting a definite diagnosis, but sometimes that isn't all av always available to us. And so I think uh, this can be a limitation in the sort of diagnostic approach, understanding the diagnosis so that we target treatment. And hearing loss, again, can be present in, in fact, in any real disorder of the ear. However, I don't think that this matters too much because the initial treatment for all ear discharge is reasonable to give antibiotic drops or antiseptics where antibiotic drops are not available, regardless of the diagnosis. That will treat the majority of things. And it may be that if that fails, uh, it, or, or rather if that is successful treatment, you may then be able to look in the ear and get the diagnosis, or the patient may not come back. But if it fails to uh, be successful, then perhaps at that point, you will uh, refer on to uh, appropriate services where the diagnosis can be made and, and further treatment uh, initiated if required. So going back to possible things that can be causing the ear discharge, like I said, it could be something in the outer ear, it could be something in the middle ear. In the outer ear, the most common thing would be an infective otitis externa. We may have eczema in the external ear, 
but this is infected otitis externa. So that's an infection of that space. And exactly what causes that infection is not that well understood. Certainly in some people, it seems to be if they go swimming, they get the ear wet, then it develops an infection. In other people, it's not always clear. And there are lots of people who will get their ears wet all the time and ha don't have any problems with infections. It may be something to do with the anatomy of the canal. It may be other factors that we haven't identified. And I'm just going to briefly mention this other disorder, which will be uh, perhaps relevant more to the specialist here of myringitis, which is also another cause of the chronic or repeated ear discharge. And it's rare, so I don't want to talk a lot about it, but I will mention it. And then thinking about the middle ear space, um, it's usually, well, it has to be really associated with the hole in the eardrum. If you don't have a hole in the eardrum, you're not going to get the discharge coming out and visible or, or noticeable to the patient. So there can be various things that can cause that. And that can be, of course, a, a, an ear infection, an acute otitis media, that's where the bacteria have got up that new station tube, gone into that space, caused pain usually um, in the, well, almost always pain in the ear, maybe associated with the temperature. And in some cases, that eardrum will burst and then there will be discharge coming out of the ear. So usually, typically with that sort of disorder, it's going to be a history of recent severe pain. Then you can have what's called chronic suppurative otitis media. That means, uh, chronic obviously means uh, uh, persistence, something that's going on for some time. Um, so that means a uh, discharge that comes out of the ear over a period. And it may be that it's continuously discharging, or it may be that the ear discharges from time to time. And again, it's going to be a hole in the eardrum that you see. So if you see a hole in the eardrum with discharge coming from time to time, that is chronic suppurative otitis media, of course. Typically, the patient has mild or no pain because the, per the, the, the eardrum where the pain fibers sit have already, is already perforated. It's already got a hole in it. It's not that the, um, there's going to be stretch of those fibers. It's just going to uh, weep pus out, so out of the ear. And again, it's not always clear what causes infection in this, it, um, but I'll come on to talk about that. It may be that water gets in, it may be that people pick up a virus, it may be other factors we don't know. And then finally, again, I'm sure a lot of this audience is aware of this, is cholesteatoma, which is where the skin of the tympanic membrane, so the squamous epithelium, the outer lining of the eardrum, um, seems to grow abnormally and grows inwards. Um, it's a rare disorder, but obviously important, especially for those who are non-specialists to recognize or for, the, for us to recognize in the ear that's not uh, stopping to discharging. So just talking a little bit about otitis externa. There may be signs on the outside, so it may be that the skin is erythematous or is this broken down. So here you can see this pinna. This looks more like eczema to me, but it may uh, signify an infection deep down. And again, if you don't have an otoscope, this suggests the, the presence of otitis externa. What you can't say for certain, however, is whether the otitis externa is perhaps secondary to an otitis media with a perforation. So it's possible that this debris is actually coming from the middle ear, there's a hole in the eardrum, it's all leaking out and then causing an inflammation of the outer ear. But like I said before, perhaps it doesn't matter because you're going to treat it initially with topical antibiotic drops or topical antiseptics, if those are not available. When you perform otoscopy, if you have an otoscope available, you're going to see debris in the ear canal classically, as you can see in this middle picture. Um, and that's actually the skin, of course, that's, um, that's become unhealthy and it's just coming into the middle ear space. In more severe cases, the ear canal may be very, very swollen. And you can see this picture on the right. And when it is this swollen, it may be very difficult to get access into the ear. And sometimes we put some packing inside the ear to just open that up impregnated with antibiotics or antiseptics to try and get things to calm down a little so that we can then put in our treatments such as topical drops. So in terms of treatment, it's important that the patient keeps the ear dry. They often will during an acute infection, but also at, at once we've got the infection resolved, 
if the ear gets wet again in the near future, it may well get another infection because that moisture may get trapped. And if the moisture is trapped, it's going to encourage bacteria to grow. We know from these reviews, so this sort of uh, uh, mechanism I mentioned called Cochrane, uh, which looks at all the evidence, the antibiotic drops do seem to work um, in the majority of cases. So usually you just need antibiotics and everything will settle. There's no particular antibiotic drop that is recommended. They, uh, we don't have enough evidence to say that one is better than the other. So hopefully it's whatever you can get hold of. Now I appreciate that not everybody can get hold of antibiotic drops. And so there's also the alternative of using acetic acid. Acetic acid is actually vinegar. Um, and I certainly know uh, in some situations where people cannot get hold of anything, they will can get hold of vinegar and they will put vinegar inside the ear. So acetic acid is actually can be quite effective. It essentially dries the ear, dries everything out. And if there are bacteria or even fungus present in the ear, the acetic acid just dries it out and kills those um, uh, organisms. You do have to be a little bit careful if you think there might be a hole in the eardrum because acetic acid going through into the middle ear potentially could cause some damage to the inner ear. Uh, we don't even, we don't really know if that um, is a serious risk, but certainly some caution is advised. Some people will give tablet antibiotics, but we certainly have a lot, le lot less evidence to suggest that that's going to be effective. So as with most discharge, discharging ears, it's usually best if you give treatment directly into the ear where feasible. If you can't get antibiotic drops, you may wish to try acetic acid. You may give oral antibiotics, antibodies by mouth, if, if that's what you have available. The technique for giving the drops is also important. Of course, the patient should be on their side and that's to allow the drops to get down and you should straighten the ear canal. So in an adult, you're going to pull the ear back and out, um, back and up, sorry, to straighten the ear canal. In a child, you tend to pull it just straight back. This will allow the drops to uh, penetrate down as far as possible deep into the ear canal. You need some care. Often the, the ear is actually very quite tender in this sort of infection, the outer ear infection. And so uh, just be aware of that and teach the patient, of course, to continue with any drops you've given using the same approach. They may need someone to help them, particularly if they're a child. If that fails, then cleaning the ear is a good idea. And indeed, if you have the facility to clean the ear in you, uh, your setting, that would be an important part of the management because all that infected dead skin is just lying there. And it's obviously much better if you clean that out and then you put in the antibiotics because you're going to get much more of the antibiotic onto the actual uh, infected skin rather than just lying on top of a lot of infected uh, debris. So if you're uh, in a situation where you don't have the ability to clean the ear out, you would try with some treatments first, as I've mentioned, and if that fails, you would consider uh, referring, hopefully, to somewhere that has facilities for cleaning out the ear. That's usually effective. So as I mentioned, this is not going to be necessarily relevant for the majority of people who may be listening to this talk, but perhaps for some of you on, uh, who are listening live, and that's meringitis. Meringitis is an inflammation of the outer layer of the eardrum. Um, you may have seen it, you may not have. And I'm just going to mention as another cause of discharge of the ear. This is what it may look like. So on the left, you've got an area of meringitis. That eardrum has a, a patch of some redness across it um, up in the superior part here, as you can see, and some granulation tissue. So this is what I call a focal meringitis. Part of the eardrum is inflamed. In this picture on the right, it's much more profuse. It's very, very inflamed. The whole eardrum is replaced by this thick inflamed tissue. Despite years of research, we don't really understand what causes this. Sometimes it seems to happen after an operation. Sometimes people just present with it and it can be quite difficult to treat. I'm just mentioning it so that you can uh, sort of recognize um, that it exists. There is some evidence that if you give 
steroids, so anti-inflammatory uh, medication into the ears, um, either as drops or sometimes if you have a steroid injection, you can place that over the area. It may calm things down. Some people also give antibiotics. We're not sure whether antibiotics help because it's not clear that this is an infection. It's just a persistent inflammation. If you have the facilities, and I appreciate that that may not be uh, possible everywhere, there is evidence to uh, do surgery to remove the abnormal part of the eardrum, um, and that can be uh, effective. And I've certainly had some that have settled using that. So that was the outer ear. And then thinking about what other things could be causing ear discharge, I was going to come on to middle ear problems. So that's otitis media, of course, inflammation of that middle ear space. So acute otitis media, that's your normal ear infection, of course, is very, very common, particularly in children, but also seen in adults. And typically, as I mentioned, people will, of course, present with pain in the ear and um, uh, sometimes a temperature. It's only a small number that will present with uh, discharge because the eardrum has burst and they've now got um, a perforation uh, of the tympanic membrane. So this might be the sort of sequence that you see. So someone may sort of start with some ear pain, as you can see on the picture on the left here, this is actually quite an inflamed eardrum. Um, it's not always clear. Sometimes the eardrum just looks a little red and it's not clear what's going on. But if someone's saying that they've got ear pain, then it's likely to be an acute otitis media, a, a, an ear infection. Obviously with younger children, they may not be able to tell you, they may just be crying. Then as it progresses, if it progresses, often it just settles down within a day or two days. But if it progresses, there may be temperature as well. People may become quite unwell. In this picture in the middle, you can see that there's actually pus um, building up behind the eardrum. So as well as quite a lot of pain, this patient may start to have temperature because there's pus trapped inside, causing them to have a fever. And in fact, around one in three uh, children who have an ear infection will get some sort of fever. Again, usually this will settle down, but in about one in 50 cases of ear infection, the eardrum will burst because of the pressure that it's under and because of the pus actually causing some damage to it, eventually it bursts. At that point, often, if the hole is big, the patient will say, oh, the pain is much better because the eardrum has burst, but they might start getting discharge coming out of the ear. So I'm talking about treatment really only here where an eardrum has burst. If you've just got an acute otitis media and ear infection, you don't necessarily need to give antibiotics unless the patient is quite unwell or the infection has been going on for some time. I appreciate that in lower resource settings, sometimes patients do present only when their infection is quite bad or has been going on for some time. So it may be that actually you give antibiotics, but certainly in England and the UK, we often don't give antibiotics for this because usually it just settles up by itself. If you've got a hole in the eardrum, that is an indication, um, according to the evidence, to give antibiotics. And you can give them by mouth, such as amoxicillin, um, which is, should hopefully be available in many different settings. It's on the World Health Organization list of essential medications. So I would hope that many of you, if not all of you, have access to this particular antibiotic. But if there is a hole in the eardrum, you can also, of course, give drops such as ciprofloxacin drops, if you have them, or any other antibiotic drops that you have available. Um, the ear can be, of course, still very tender and sensitive, so it may cause some stinging. However, in this case, usually the eardrum heals. So this is not a common cause of repeated ear discharge. It's just an episode of ear discharge associated with pain. So I'm going to come on to talk about this disorder, chronic suppurative otitis media. Um, and that's a persistent um, ear infection or, or a repeated ear infection. So what leads to this is not entirely clear. It's a major global uh, burden uh, around the world. So it's estimated probably around 250 million people have this disorder, but what leads to it is not clear. It certainly seems to be um, associated with socioeconomic deprivation. So poverty really is one of the big things that leads to this. Um, 
and uh, certain countries, particularly, for example, uh, Southeast Asia or the Pacific region will have very high rates of this and certain indigenous populations also have very high rates of this disease. It may follow this acute otitis, this ear infection with a perforation, with a hole in the eardrum. It is possible that that doesn't settle and then you are left with a hole in the eardrum that never healed. But that may not be the only way because certainly a lot of the patients I see with this don't give a history of an ear infection. They just present with a hole in the eardrum. There's some evidence we think that it may be that there's persistent inflammation in the ear. So we have other disorders of inflammation in the ear, such as glue ear, for example. Perhaps we think it could be a persistent problem, which if it persists in some people, it causes the eardrum to thin and to eventually create a hole because of the persisting inflammation in the ear. So that's possibly one other way to get a hole in the eardrum. Or it could be because a surgeon has done something. So for example, for treating glue ear, we may do surgery inserting a tube called grommets, not available in every country, but available in some countries. And one of the risks of putting a tube into the ear, this grommet, is that you can be left with a hole in the eardrum on a permanent basis. So that may be the cause of the hole in the eardrum. Or it could be an injury. So there may be some trauma to the ear, either um, a road traffic accident, sometimes it can be a big blast injury from sound that causes a hole into the eardrum. Most of those injuries will actually heal, but some of them will not. And again, you'll be left with a hole in the eardrum. But uh, lots of people present, in my experience, with a hole in the eardrum, and it's not entirely clear where it has come from. Now, if there's just a hole in the eardrum, of course, they may just complain of a hearing loss and not have a discharging ear, or they may not have a hearing loss at all. If the hole is quite small, some patients have no symptoms, and this is just found um, by the by. You just happen to look in an ear and you find there's a hole there. But in some cases, it's worse than that, and it does lead to infections. And so there is ear discharge from time to time. And then, of course, the patient will, um, uh, uh, as well as the hearing loss, will also say that they have ear discharge. The dis discharge can be either from time to time or it may be there all the time and it never stops. Sometimes they have some pain as well, but it's usually mild and that's uh, usually the difference between obviously a, a recent ear infection um, causing a new hole in the eardrum versus one that's been there for some time and is now just discharging uh, pus. Um, from, from time to time. And, it, and as I say, what exactly causes this discharge to start or to come back is not clear. Sometimes it's people getting water into their ear that goes through that hole and makes it very wet in that middle ear space. Other times it is uh, perhaps they picked up a virus and bacteria go up the eustachian tube, go into that space and then come out through the hole. Or there may be other things that we don't fully understand. So when you've got that discharging hole in the eardrum, um, what treatment do we offer? So I think personally, it's very important to try and clean as much of that pus away. Again, we're going to give topical treatments, that's treatments directly onto the uh, infected area. But first we should clean the ear to get rid of as much pus as possible because putting, for example, antibiotics onto pus um, uh, is far less effective than if you've got a, a cleaner ear. So again, people should keep their ear dry, of course. And then we want to clean out the ear. And one easy way to do this is using tissue spears. So I've become quite a fan of tissue spears. It's just simply getting some tissue. Um, toilet roll is not ideal, but if that's all you've got, then you can use that. And rolling it up into this um, little uh, spear, as it were, uh, uh, and putting that inside the ear. Then you just leave it inside there. It'll absorb the pus and then take it out and then repeat and keep doing it until there's no more pus um, coming out. It, it's quite dry. That will help to absorb all that pus and allow you to get deeper down. This is not gonna cause any harm. At the worst, if you touch the eardrum, it'll cause some pain and the person will stop, but it's, not, it's too soft to cause any harm to any structures inside. The other possibility is to wash out the ear. So we can use antiseptics to clean the ear such as iodine-based antiseptics, which are widely available. Um, uh, and that can be a useful treatment. 
So you can get a syringe, uh, fill it with some iodine, dilute the iodine um, antiseptic a little and wash the ear out, usually directing the wash up towards um, the top of the ear canal. I actually work for the World Health Organization's program on uh, ear and hearing care, and we will soon be creating some videos which will be freely available online, demonstrating how to do this for people who are less experienced. But we don't really have any good evidence that this by itself is effective in treating these problems, but that's not because it isn't, it's probably because we haven't done enough um, investigations, any trials really of this medication. And that is something again, that I'm trying to get started to see if this by itself may be beneficial because I recognize that not everywhere has um, antibiotic drops available. The ideal is to give antibiotic drops and this series of reviews that we've just completed actually suggests you can use any antibiotic drops, but probably um, drops of uh, the antibiotic class quinolones. So that includes drugs such as ciprofloxacin, ofloxacin, norfloxacin. If you have those available, those seem to be highly effective. They also don't seem to have any potential risk of damaging the inner ear. And that's the same of iodine, I should have mentioned. Um, if you're going to use anti, uh, uh, antiseptics, which, such as iodine, iodine is harmless to the ear. Alcohol-based antiseptics can damage the inner ear and so really should not be used. If you don't have antibiotic drops available, um, then you can use antibiotics by mouth. When we did our reviews, we found that antibiotics by mouth didn't seem to be as effective as antibiotic drops which again makes sense because of course, you're going to get much higher concentrations of the antibiotic, uh, much stronger strength into the ear if you give it directly. You're also gonna have less side effects, of course, because the antibiotics don't go into the rest of the body, whereas antibiotics by mouth can give you side effects such as diarrhea. In this instance, when you're giving antibiotics, as well as um, asking the patient to lean over um, and as they're dropped in and stay on their side so the drops move down, I also recommend using something called a tragal massage. So the tragus, the bit in front of the pinna, um, as you can see on the picture here, should be pushed. And what that does is it pumps those drops deep down and hopefully through any hole and deep down into the middle ear space where the ear where the middle ear infection exists. So that's an important thing. And sometimes a patient will say that they can taste something. And that's because the drops have gone all the way through the eardrum and also passed down the eustachian tube. And that tells you that you have got the drops into the middle ear space. So why would treatment not work? Because it doesn't always work. So in our review, we found that drops seem to work about 70 to 80% of the time. And in some cases, they don't work. So there might be several reasons for that. One might be the drops didn't get to where they were supposed to get to. It may be that the technique was not great. Um, it may be that you didn't explain it very well, the patient didn't understand it very well. They haven't been putting their head to the side. They haven't been massaging. Maybe they haven't been putting enough drops in. Um, we normally say two or three drops. If it's ciprofloxacin, to be honest, you can use many more than that because it seems to be pretty harmless. It's possible that there was too much pus in the ear. If there's too much pus, your drops are really not going to get on top of that. And so it's important that the ear is clean. And that may include wash out with antiseptic. It may include sucking out the ear if you've got the facilities. It may include using the tissue spears that I've mentioned. The other possibility is that the hole in the eardrum is too small. And I've certainly seen this from time to time. So in some perforations, I've actually borrowed this slide from GE Out e Outreach's uh, uh, website. Some perforations are tiny. You have a very small hole. Then it's very difficult for the drops to actually get through that hole. So again, if you have the expertise and the availability, what I suggest is you get a syringe with a blunt needle, you fill it with some antibiotic drops, and you squirt through that hole. And in fact, I did that just last week on a, on a case that just wouldn't settle and it settled straight away. So that can be quite effective for those few cases where you've got a very small hole with discharge coming through. 
other things that may be responsible for why your treatment didn't work. There can be poor quality medicines. Certainly in some countries, uh, for example, in India, there's been found to be quite a lot of counterfeit medications. So effectively, you may be using water rather than antibiotics in your drops. And so that's just something to think about. And hopefully uh, for many of you um, in lower resource settings, you'll either be assured that you have high quality medications or you can ask your ministry to hopefully check the medications if they have the ability to do so. Other reasons why the treatment didn't work? It might be that the bacteria that are inside there are resistant to the antibiotics. So they don't respond to the antibiotics that you've been putting in because they have resistance to that. It may be that the infection actually has quite a lot of fungus in there. That tends to be seen with otitis externa, but I've also seen that with otitis media. There's pus coming out and there's now fungus in the outer ear. Sometimes you even see fungus in the middle ear space. If it's obvious, then you obviously can treat with an antifungal medication. But if it's not obvious, and if you're failing, then I would suggest if you have the ability, you take a swab for microbiology. These are the cases that have failed to settle and you send to the laboratory for culture. Again, I appreciate that that's not always available to everybody. And so it may be that you just have to try something else as best you can to try and get this to settle because you can't grow the bacteria as you'd like to. It's also possible that your treatment fails because the infection is too established. So we know that in very uh, long standing discharging years, it seems to be more difficult to get them dry. We know that bacteria can live in their own little families, something called biofilms, where they actually create um, effectively a house of bacteria, where they live in a house and they create a roof over them. And that roof protects them from everything. And um, so they live in the middle ear space, they have this roof over them, and if you put antibiotic drops onto them, it doesn't even touch them. And that's something called a biofilm. So that may be why you can't get rid of them. Or it could be that the bacteria are living in the mastoid. We're putting drops down through this hole in the eardrum, trying to get into that whole middle ear space. But probably we're not getting a lot into the mastoid. And it may be that in that mastoid, there's lots of bacteria living and they just come back, um, off, which is a reason why your treatment fails. Or it may be that there is a different diagnosis then actually there's this other disorder called cholesteatoma, which I'll talk about at the end. And that may be a reason your treatment has failed because you're, not, you're treating something different that will not respond long-term to antibiotic drops. And then of course, the treatment can be surgery. So that is moringoplasty to repair the eardrum. Um, and what we don't know is if you treat um, an ear that's been discharging for a long, long time, whether actually you get the eardrum dry, sorry, you get the ear dry and the eardrum heals by itself. In my experience, it doesn't, and you're still going to have a hole in the eardrum and it will probably recur. So in that situation where a patient has either repeated ear discharge or, or quite a hearing loss associated with the hole in the eardrum and it's not healed of its own accord, you could offer a moringoplasty. And obviously, that's a repair of the eardrum, which tends to be successful in 80 to 90% of the time. And again, I appreciate that that depends upon the availability in your facility of things such as microscopes, such as instruments um, um, available to do this sort of surgery. There's also sometimes the ossicles, so the bones of hearing, are um, eroded from the persistent infection in some of these cases. And um, I'd say about one in 10 cases um, in low resource settings, I find that the, the bones of hearing are also destroyed. And if you're lucky enough to have artificial bones, you can put those in. If not, you can do surgery um, on the um, ossicles. So for example, uh, taking the incus, uh, turning it around, carving it, and trying to get uh, the bones uh, to, uh, the ossicles to realign. Um, again, I'm not gonna go into the surgery here today because that's probably a difference for the talk. And then finally, I was just going to mention cholesteatoma. So cholesteatoma, uh, many of you will be aware, is this skin of the eardrum that grows abnormally and the cause of it is not clear. It seems to be people who've had some sort of problem for their, with their ear and ear um, inflammation for, for quite some time and the skin of the eardrum grows and becomes abnormal and then becomes this mass of skin that's growing by itself and simply won't stop growing. There is an associated hole in the eardrum from where that skin has grown inwards. And so they will present with 
sometimes persistent ear discharge, sometimes discharge that comes and goes. They might have some mild pain and they might have some hearing loss. The problem is that those symptoms, of course, don't tell you that it's a cholesteatoma. That could be a hole in the eardrum. It could even be otitis externa that's not settling. And so it's critical is to the diagnosis is having a look and finding its appearance on otoscopy. The presence of skin in the middle ear space basically, of course, clinches a diagnosis of cholesteatoma. So it's rare, thought to affect one in 10,000 people uh, per year, but it's an important diagnosis because it can be dangerous. So I always tell people to be beware of discharging air that will not settle. Um, beware of the, uh, if you see a polyp on the ear. Uh, will not settle. Yeah. So the risks of cholesteatoma are that if it continues to grow, you, it could cause hearing loss through damage of the ossicles, facial weakness if it erodes into the facial nerve, which of course runs through that middle ear space, or if it spreads above the ear and goes uh, into other structures, in particular around the brain, to cause meningitis or to cause a brain abscess. The leading cause of abscess in the brain, um, in, uh, the, in the area, the temporal lobe of the brain just above the ear is ear disease. So here's some examples of cholesteatoma. On the left is an early cholesteatoma, this sort of skin that's developed up in the top of the eardrum. Um, it looks like a bit of wax, but of course it's trapped skin that's growing in. Um, and actually, if you look carefully, you can see it's down here as well. So it's grown through behind the eardrum. This is a more extensive cholesteatoma in the middle. And here, a lot of the ear has been destroyed the tympanic membrane is, is, is uh, the eardrum is missing, as well as some erosion of the bone, and probably the bones of hearing, the ossicles, have also been destroyed um, and surrounded by this mass. And then the picture on the right is an ear polyp. So this sort of inflamed bruised tissue, what we call granulation tissue, that's just there and won't settle. And it's not unusual, in my experience, it's quite common, that if you um, get that polyp to settle down or you remove it underneath there, there will be a cholesteatoma that's causing this um, bruised appearance. And the treatment, of course, is usually a surgery on the mastoid because this is usually grown from behind the eardrum into that whole mastoid air cell space and it needs to be removed and surgery is the only treatment that's available. Again, this talk is not about mastoid surgery, so I'm not going to go into the details of that. So I think I'll end there and thank you. Happy to take any questions okay Mooch, listen thank you um you know there's a couple of comments i have before other people might um wish to ask any questions and that is you know with with myringitis there's no doubt it's a difficult condition i've had a little success success in curetting the drum carefully with like a mastoid curette and then going ahead and putting, you know, topical steroids, you know, otofloxin, ciprofloxin. I've had some success, but when you've got that whole drum, that's the whole drum, you're right. It's, it's, it's quite difficult. You, you know, some of the, I questioned some, you know, whether or not, you know, we have bullous meringitis, which is, you know, an inflammation with bulla. I wonder if, if, you know, there might be a viral component to meringitis and we're just not looking at it. Know. Yeah, sure. Um, when I've looked at the literature, I think I've concluded nobody really knows. Um, so you'd think there's some sort of trapped infection inside there, but yeah, who knows? Um, the things that I found is I, I uh, like you, I tried topical treatments. I haven't tried curetting in the clinic, but uh, I've only dealt with a few. But what I've done there is I've actually excised, if hopefully if it's just a small area, excised the whole area. And then I've actually done an overlay graft. So I take, it's usually all lateral to the fibrous layer. It doesn't go deeper than the fibrous layer. So rather than taking away the whole eardrum and going through and removing the fibrous layer, I actually just take off the surface um, skin, the surface epithelium, and then do an overlay graft. So lift up the rest of the skin and stick fascia in. I've only done a few of those, but uh, so far, every single one has worked. But uh, yeah, small numbers. So I'm not going to claim success. You know, the other thing is I have used diluted iodine solution in some of the uh, resource limited countries that we've gone to. 
it does work. It does work. It's like anything else. There's no, there's nothing that works 100% of the time, but it's definitely cost effective and, you know, readily available, relatively speaking. And um, as a, you know, just like with vinegar, it's a, a first line of defense that we can use that's, you know, affordable, you know, especially when there's no, no antibiotic drops available. I agree, and I'm trying to get some funding together to do a um, a good randomized controlled trial just to show how effective it is, because I think uh, it would be a fantastic uh, available resource and community as well. It doesn't need prescription. It doesn't need worry about, you know, how do I get hold of these antibiotics? And it's cheap as well, of course. So for those patients who are impoverished, it presents a realistic solution. And of course, I would hope that patients themselves would be able to use it as well. So, mm -hmm. no, I think, I think that's a really good idea. The question is, you know, what's the dosage or the concentration of the solution? That's the question. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and that's a question that's actually come up in the chat, I can see. So I tend to dilute it about one in 10, um, just because that's what people have used in the past. Um, but if others have experience of using um, a more concentrated solution, that's fine as well. I think probably as much as anything, it is, of course, technique, because you want to make sure you wash everything out, all of that debris, and you don't want to squirt it straight down the air. You want to push it um, slightly directed uh, superiorly, because you don't want to put the squirt straight onto the tympanic membrane and potentially cause harm, uh, or even worse, high pressure straight onto the ossicles, which could cause harm. So I tend to use a one in 10 dilution um, and squirt it inside the ear probably ideally two or three times um, uh, a day. And uh, like I say, there will be a video, uh, there is a video that's already been made. We're trying to finalize that, hopefully by next year, it will be part of the World Health Organization's uh, primary ear and hearing care manual, the revised version, which is coming out, hopefully next year, will be accompanied by a series of videos on how to undertake some of these practical skills. And of course, will be freely available. It will be translated um, into all of the um, official languages of the World Health Organization, but people will hopefully steal it and translate it into their own language as well. Sounds good. Um, Mood, we have uh, Azi from Somaliland. He's got a question for us. Okay, Azi, please go ahead. Azi. Yeah, Prof. Good morning. Hello, Prof. Yeah, morning, Prof. Uh, it's out, it's actually late in uh, night in night time in our city in Burma. I'm from Somaliland, uh, the northern region of Somalia, where we have a lot of uh, discharging ears. And in my experience, we have also counterfeit uh, eardrops. So in the, my experience, in my experience of iodine solution, I have tried with some of my difficult patients, uh, when, especially when I do examination under a microscope and clean the whole bus, I put some 10% uh, iodine and successfully I've seen a lot of patients has responded to iodine more than the ear drops. So I think it's effective um, if it can be he studied more, I think he'll be, but I didn't do any safety. I'm just talking about my simple cases that I have seen, just my short experience, what I've seen. Well, thank you, Professor Butev and uh, Professor Fletcher for your. Thank you. Well, your experience is far more valuable than mine because uh, you're dealing with it. Um, I, I don't use that as much. I've used it on occasion when I've been in these low resource settings. So that's good to hear. Um, for me, it makes a lot of sense because actually when we use drops, we only use very, very small volumes uh, usually, and we expect it to coat this whole space. Um, whereas I think um, iodine washout, if done well, should actually coat a much bigger area um, uh, and provide antiseptic. So um, I'm very pleased to hear that you've uh, found it to be useful. Um, I think it is a good thing. And I think um, it'd just be good to do some, some trials to um, sort of um, work out the actual data on how effective it is, which is an important thing to try and push it forward to say, this is what we should be using. So thank you for sharing your experience. You know, thank you, Prof. Let me, Appreciate it. Let me kind of add to that. You know, I've done, I, I did it one time in my career 
do a lot of work in Southeast Asia, in Cambodia. And their drugs come from either China or India. The majority of the time I'm talking about not only antibiotics, but I'm talking about simple epinephrine. And there was no doubt, there was no doubt the drugs that came from China were much worse than the drugs that came from India. India has a huge pharmaceutical industry, much higher standards than China, okay? And they still have counterfeit stuff that comes out of India, but at a much less rate than you do out of China. We would use three to four times the dose of epinephrine in Cambodia just to get the you know, vasoconstrictive effect of the medication, let alone the fact that the antibiotics, forget it, forget it. Unless you had one that was imported, much more expensive, the drugs, there's a huge, a huge black market for counterfeit medications. Um, those are my, my contributions. Anybody else have any, any comments? We usually have, uh, Misha, do you have any, any comments or, or uh, Roman? Roman, do you have any comments from Ukraine? I certainly uh, do. Hi, Mood. It's absolutely lovely to hear you speak. And I think I just wanted to say I thought it was a particularly relevant and useful lecture for uh, this group. I hope that um, on the on the Geo YouTube, it'll get it'll get uh, an even wider exposure. Um, my question really relates to the practicalities of keeping the ear dry and reducing the chance of infections from stagnant water and swimming in pools, that sort of thing. Um, Mu, do you have any specific advice from a public health point of view uh, on how people in resource limited settings keep their ears dry and in terms of where it is safe to swim and where it is not safe to swim, um, particularly with children? Uh, thanks, Misha. Um, uh, not an easy question to answer. So. The ideal, of course, is that um, you should keep your ear dry full stop. If there is, you, you shouldn't let any water get in. Obviously, if, if um, a space is uh, more dirty, such as stagnant water, you'd imagine that's full of bacteria as opposed to um, a, a river, for example, a fresh, fresh water river. Having said that, of course, if the water then gets in and is trapped inside the middle ear space, that is much more likely to cause problems. I've certainly had some patients who seem to get their ear wet with a hole in the eardrum and have no problems, but that is the minority. So in terms of what can you do, um, I know that, uh, uh, you know, certainly in the UK, we would use, for example, some cotton wool, we're covered with some sort of petroleum jelly and put that into the ear, whether or not that's available in low resource settings, uh, I'm not sure. I also know of people using things such as uh, some uh, like, uh, uh, a compound such as uh, the commercial uh, product blue tack and putting that in their ear to protect the eardrum but i do i have certainly found that this is um perhaps uh, uh unrealistic so uh, i've done some work in remote parts of australia as well with the aboriginal populations who have huge rates of chronic suppurative otitis media and to suggest to a child that they should not go and jump in the watering hole when it is 45 degrees celsius outside is perhaps uh, quite unrealistic but i'd be very happy to hear if anyone here has any um uh, good useful tips in that regard thanks mood I, th I think it's one of those very difficult situations um espe especially as you say in those settings where jumping in the watering hole is far, far too tempting <laughs> thank you I uh, appreciate that, Misha. Um, Oscar, do you have any comments from Ukraine? Hello. Uh, thank you for such a nice presentation. Um, the comments maybe sometimes we question actually the quality of our medicines that are available. And I, I believe that Richard can confirm this uh, information. Uh, and but the the other uh, especially topical treatment as as you mentioned in your presentation for otitis media and externa is is actually widely available in Ukraine and it's 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 pretty cheap. Uh, for example, the the 
the bottle of eardrops is cost around three US dollars uh, in Ukraine. So uh, I don't think that people here have problems with buying the, the, the basic uh, uh, treatment for such conditions. But uh, it was nice to hear that uh, the, uh, the acetic acid that you mentioned, the, the vinegar is actually very helpful in terms of treatment of hepatitis. All right, anybody else have any comments they'd like to share with us? If not, I'd like to thank you for his, uh, for his evening, uh, evening talk. Uh, you know, I think there, you know, we got to look at other things, especially when we got these small perforations about, you know, blunt needle injection of, you know, medication transtympanically. And then we, sh we should always never forget that the mastoid is a culprit of harboring disease if you get a chronic graining ear. So uh, surgically addressing that is something that one always has to keep in the back of their mind. So in that, with that said, Mood, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate your time and um, thank you everybody for joining today. We'll put this on YouTube uh, channel for Misha um, later today or tomorrow and for other people who couldn't join they can watch it. So Mood, thank you. Everybody have a good holiday and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Pro